Welcome to the Skull King Football Podcast, presented by Fox DFS Firelines. Now, here are your hosts, Justin and Ryan Skullrude. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Skull King Fantasy Football Podcast. Hopefully, your Week 10 was kinder than it was to me, but uh, once again, I am your host, Justin Skullrude, back from a brief absence from the show. Uh, Ryan is joining me once again uh, as the founder of Skull King Fantasy Football. Uh, Ryan, why don't you say hello? Hey, everybody. How's it going? Hope, yeah, like Justin said, I hope your guys' Week 10s were not as brutal as ours were. Yes, uh, we are in the Week 10 apocalypse. So many teams on by, and it only gets worse next week with even more big-name teams like Denver and Atlanta out. A lot of people are going to be scrambling to find people on the waiver wire to sub in for their players, and so we're going to be going over some waiver wire pickups for this week. We're also going to be doing some news and notes from the Week 10 uh, NFL season. We're also going to be covering some big stars. And so right off the bat, we do want to cover uh, some big news. Uh, it was originally reported earlier today, uh, and once again, this is Monday, that Rob Gronkowski had a punctured lung uh, that he sustained in the game against Seattle. It was then later reported that it was just uh, a chest injury Um I believe, uh, yeah, it just said that it's a, it's a chest injury. Not overly serious is the uh, report that came out just a few hours ago. Um, there was original concern when it was a punctured lung that he could miss a week. Uh, now that it's saying that it's just a punctured lung and that it's not, quote-unquote, overly serious, it's looking like he should be able to be a go for this week. Once again, monitor that uh, as we move forward. Um, the other big news that we have, uh, kind of the big star news related, uh, is that Alshon Jeffrey is going to be suspended for four weeks for failing or for violating rather the PED policy. Um, I'm Ryan, do you have a little bit more information on this one? I know that, uh, it, it feels like he's getting the hammer midway through the season on this. Um, But, Ryan, what are your thoughts on how this uh, affects the Bears? Obviously, most likely not a playoff team with with their horrible record right now, but how do you think this affects the offense moving forward? Well, this basically, you know, really crushes their their passing offense. Um, You know, again, Jay Cutler is Jay Cutler, and he showed that this last weekend – but uh, it looks like, uh, in terms of in terms of the the some of the specifics on 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 Jeffrey's suspension, uh, looked like he he admitted to taking a supplement, um, uh, a recommended supplement to combat inflammation is the quote uh, here. Um, he admitted to taking it and uh, and said that he takes full responsibility for not looking uh, looking into the supplement that he was that he was using. Um, so he t- he's at least taking responsibility. Um, one of the jokes I've heard about uh, him um, taking uh, performance-enhancing drugs is usually if you take those, they help you perform. So why is he, <laughs> so why is he being suspended? Um, but uh, well, yeah, because he hasn't performed. So no, no, at least not. not lately. Haven't worked. <laughs> um, and so yeah, I'm I'm glad that I didn't trade for him. That the guy that was going to trade him to me, decided not to. So that was more him than you. Yeah. So, you know, in terms of, in terms of how this is actually going to go for the Bears offense, I still think they stick to Jordan Howard, although Jordan Howard is – there's some questions around his ankle and foot and how he's doing. Uh, Cameron Meredith now becomes the number one. Um, we'll see how Eddie Royal does. You know he can't seem to stay healthy either, and Zach Miller as the other as the other receiving target who he's kind of back and forth doesn't have great chemistry with with Cutler. But at this point, who else is Cutler going to throw the ball to? Um, yeah. So for now, I, I <laughs> Cameron Meredith uh, or the other team. Um, well, yeah, probably Cameron. Mer- so Cameron Meredith is is you know obviously the beneficiary of this for the next four weeks. Um, looking at who 
who they're going up against. I'm not, you know, I'm not too, I'm not too thrilled about anyone um, really uh, on the bears anymore other than Jordan Howard, if he has a good injury or if he has a good uh, matchup. So uh, moving on the jets uh, have declined to name a starting quarterback uh, today for this next week, whether it is Bryce Petty or Ryan Fitzpatrick, this is not good news uh, for Marshall owners. Uh, I think this whole season has not been very good news for Marshall owners. Um, if it's Fitzpatrick or Petty, I don't really see. I think the fact that there's kind of a wash right now is helping Matt Forte more than it's helping anybody else. I think Paul Powell is getting a wash between the two. He's kind of getting those five catches and six to eight runs a game. Uh, and whatever he does with them, he does with them. He's not – it doesn't seem like he's getting any more touches regardless whether he's getting less yards or more yards. But Brandon Marshall just – they're not moving the ball enough for him to get a lot of targets. They may be targeting him, but there's not really a whole lot of other people for them to throw to. And it, Marshall's numbers have just plummeted. And so the Jets' offense has – return to kind of being the misery that the Jets have been for a few years, and I don't really see this changing anytime soon. Um, another thing to know is that the Falcons expect Tevin Coleman to be back following their Week 11 bye. This is good news for those who have Tem Tevin Coleman, and this may not necessarily be the greatest news for those who have had Devontae Freeman because they have been getting all of the share of the running back uh, points coming out of Atlanta. Now with Tevin Coleman coming back, that's going to eat into the Devontae Freeman workload. Um, other information is that um, Fitzgerald from uh, Arizona uh, had an MRI today. Um, turned out to be negative for the injury. He does uh, have some soreness, but is hopeful to be practicing later this week. And so it looks like the scare of him being out for possibly a week or two is gone. And so he, uh, once again, as a veteran, will not necessarily be practicing all week. That shouldn't be as much of a concern. Look for Friday's report to be more of the information that you should be relying on. I think the biggest concern about, about Fitzgerald, honestly, is the, the matchup against the Vikings. Uh, I think the Cardinals are more likely to, to – um, to lean on David Johnson, who has been running the crap out of the ball lately, especially with the Vikings have been have shown to be very susceptible to the run the last few weeks. So, yeah, the, the Vikings defense uh, is not what they were in the first couple of weeks. They benefited from getting, uh, I think, one week they got two touchdowns on defense. They've benefited. They have not benefited from getting turnovers or getting defensive scores over the last couple of weeks. So, those of you like me, who have had Minnesota and cheered and clamored for it at the beginning of the season, are now getting a little bit of the defensive randomness and sometimes very, very painful three points that Minnesota uh, may bring up. I don't – I see Minnesota not doing well this week. So, once again, going back to Fitzgerald, I think Fitzgerald, if he's in the game, he's going to be the red zone target, and you're, I think he still scores a touchdown this week if he's on the field. Um, Moving on to Seattle, uh, Pete Carroll said that Thomas Rawls is practicing to play this week. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about Rawls later in the show, um, but he is practicing, which has been kind of the, the long-awaited arrival, if you will, after him getting that flash in the one game uh, and then being out for basically all but a couple of plays this season. Um, and then uh, Sammy Watkins, kind of to wrap us up on my part, is Sammy Watkins is still not ready to return to practice. I know that there are people who are stashing him for a very, very late playoff run because of the fact that you will not be able to get a receiver like Sammy Watkins late. So if he can come back, that's a really, really good player to have for a playoff stash. So if you are – able to stash him on your bench, that would be a player that I would stash uh, in a position where you can afford to waste that spot. Once again, on IR, there's no indication that he will come back this year, but if he does, 
there's still that good chance of, of being a splash in the playoffs. And so, Ryan, do you have any other news or notes that you want to cover? Uh, there, the one more, there's one more injury I want to cover. It, it's not necessarily going to be one that, that gets highlighted uh, very often. Um, let me make sure I've got the right – okay. Game. Um, that uh, – uh, where is it? Just to make, There it is. Okay, so um, the Chargers' Brandon Meebane is now out for the season. He's He was their big defensive tackle up the middle that kind of helped stop up the run. San Diego is actually, in terms of yards per game, um, is number six in terms of, of – uh, rush yards giving up only 87.4 yards per game so the this is definitely going to affect them me being is was always known as one of the big run stoppers in seattle over the last few years before he we went to uh, san diego in the off season um i think that while most most times you could figure that a running back would have a pretty good game against san diego um not necessarily because of the yards, but because they give up, they they do give up a lot of uh, touchdowns to running backs on the short yardage, uh, uh, short yardage in the in the red zone. I think this really affects them being able to stop the run overall, um, and therefore it's going to be a little bit easier to stream your running back to stream running backs against San Diego's defense. So that was yeah, one of the things that uh, that is more or less helped. The run defense in San Diego is the fact that their pass defense is horrible because of injuries to the secondary, and now with an injury to the big man and the big uh, the big plug up the middle, uh, I think this does not bode well for the Chargers the rest of the season. Uh, and look for the Chargers to they're going to have to score more. And the, the, for the last couple of years, this has been the story in San Diego is plagued with injuries all over the roster. And so, uh, once again, I know this was slightly an issue last year, and now this year, once again, with with players going out early, and it looked like Phillip Rivers was not going to have anybody to throw to. Uh, now on defense, this is just another injury that's not looking good for San Diego. Um, and so, moving forward. Real quick. See, San Diego's defense is not one that you want to play. But Real quick. What in the world is going on in San Diego – all these freaking injuries. I mean, you think you think about people uh, want to spend time on the beach. I don't <laughs> <laughs> and you've got Keenan Allen who went out. Was it week one? Was it week one that Keenan Allen? Went I I believe so. Yeah. The season. Um, Danny Woodhead in week two. You've had um, Antonio Gates struggling Antonio, all year to stay healthy. But, but okay, but Antonio Gates is old, old, um, especially in terms of football years. Hunter Henry. You know, Hunter Henry's had problems staying healthy this year. And, and this is thing, these are things that have happened last year as well. Yeah. Wilvin Gordon really wasn't healthy most of the season last year. Keenan Allen knocked out halfway through the season last year. Antonio Gates was back and forth health-wise last year. You've got all these injuries on defense. You've got Everett, uh, the cornerback, has been out. Um, you know, torn ACL, I believe. Brandon Meebane up the middle is now out for the season. I you talk about a team that over the last few years has, and I guess you could say has been cursed uh, because of how many injuries they have every stinking year. I just, you know, I just want to throw that out there. Yeah. Once again, we don't, we don't cover too much of injuries on defense. It's just more covering matchups. Uh, but that one we feel of note because uh, the Chargers could still make a run, uh, I believe, uh, at the wild card position. Uh, once again, Oakland's kind of running away with that division, which some people saw at the beginning of the season just because of their good line, um, and and they are really beginning to take off uh, from a passing perspective. And so, Ryan, if you want to move on into our uh, our big stars of this last week uh, and cover uh, those who had very, very good impacts for their fantasy teams this week. Well, um, I want. There's a few things I want to look at, especially with some of the calls that we were making in terms of uh, that Greg and I were making. Who's not on the show tonight? Um, looks like he'll he will be back on our next show. Uh, in terms of of DFS and just guys that we were expecting to to have big impacts, um, I think the one that was a it was a good 
fantasy production wise game. However, we expected so much more was David Johnson. Um, San Francisco, we were, you know, we were talking about just how epically bad in our last show San Francisco's defense was. Going into this last week, they were giving up 193 yards a game on the ground. That's just running. That's, I mean, that's, that's college football bad in terms, yeah. of, in terms of run defenses. And David Johnson finished with a total of 101 yards. Only 55 yards on the ground. He averaged only 2.9 yards on the ground. And this is a home game against San Francisco. However, he did save it with, you know, two touchdowns, one on the ground and one receiving. Had, you know, five catches, 46 yards uh, receiving as well. So, I mean, in PPR leagues, it, it ended up being a pretty good game, but wasn't as, you know, as epic as, you know, everyone was hoping for. And it definitely wasn't as good of a game uh, in standard. Because no, of definitely not. So, um, so again, he's got a touchdown from your running back. Yeah, uh, you know, the, I think the the one game you know, there was two amazing games this weekend. Really, I mean, there was there was a a, a lot of games that kind of went back and forth. Had some had some good endings, but can we just take a second to talk about how good the Dallas Pittsburgh game was? Seven lead changes. And then the rematch from Super Bowl Forty Nine between New England and Seattle. I was, I'll be honest. Once again, I, another seven lead changes. Seven lead changes. You know, and I'll be honest. As a Seahawks fan, I was not expecting that kind of a result with Seattle on a short week going into New England, in which New England was coming off of a bye and had not turned the ball over. And had you know, and no had, not, had not thrown in an interception yet this season. I, I was I wasn't expecting anything like that, and just amazed by how well. Um, oh, and then how bad our offense had been playing, Seattle's offense had been playing, and then to see the game that Russell Wilson put up against against the New England defense, going twenty five for thirty seven, three hundred and forty eight yards three TDs, all three of which to Doug Baldwin, who at this point last year was doing the exact same thing. This is when Doug Baldwin really started going off. And so he is the go-to guy for uh, Russell Wilson at this point in the year. So if you've got Doug Baldwin, I, especially at home, I'm looking at playing Doug Baldwin every week. Yeah, he's been disappointing so far this year, but let's be honest. Russell Wilson has not been healthy, and he is proving to be healthy. You took look at the last uh, two games, um, even last week against Buffalo, 20 for 26, 282, and two TDs. This week, 25 for 37, 348, and three TDs. No intercept. He's still only thrown two interceptions on the season. He's only thrown for 10 touchdowns and run for one, but he's only thrown two interceptions. So he's still taking care of the ball. And then you had C.J. Proceis, who, you know, we had been talking about the fact that he was going to get more work, um, that they had been talking about it all week, that um, Pete Carroll had been talking about the fact he was going to get more work. Everyone was thinking, you know, Chris Michael's not doing as much lately, so this could be, you know, this could be really big for C.J. Proceis. And, okay, the, his, his yards per carry, only 3.9, but he was finding the holes, getting as much, getting, you know, a couple extra years, spinning off some hits. Um, the offensive line for Seattle really seemed to be getting it going. And 17 rushes for 66 yards. He didn't have a TD. He had the one that, that looked like it was a TD and they got called back. Or that they, they called, said it wasn't, and then the, there wasn't enough uh, on the review, there wasn't enough evidence to overturn. But uh, also had seven catches for 87 yards. Um, so, I mean, he finished with 100, was 150, 153 yards on the night. And that's, that's huge. And then with seven catches, that's a huge PPR night. Uh, with Thomas Rawls coming back, we'll see kind of how precise, um, um, how his usage is, goes down a little bit. I think he stays in that third down passing role. But I'm excited to see where Procise uh, where Procise can go. 
And then, you know, it, staying in that game, the other, you know, we talked about Bald when we talked about ProSize. The other guy that really had the, the good game in there, while it wasn't, you know, great stat-wise in terms of runs, you know, rushes or yards per rush, uh, was LeGarrette Blunt with three TDs. He is now leading the league. Uh, gosh, how many does he have? Does he have 12? Yeah, he's got 12. Yeah, 12. One forced trauma. <laughs> yeah. Good grief. Yeah, no kidding. He so, won't get a lot, but he'll get the ones that hurt. Yeah, 12, yeah, 12 TDs leading the league in terms of rushing touchdowns. Um, you know, and he's, he's been a, a fantastic surprise so far this year. Um, everyone thought that James White was going to be more productive, and they've gone back and forth. Um, but, you know, in terms of just all out, um, really, really just putting up the points consistently. I mean, going over, he said three TDs, one, two, one. So seven, good grief. He's had eight TDs in the last five weeks. He's only had one game which he hasn't scored a touchdown. That so much for those who predicted his production to go down when Tom Brady came back. Yeah. So. I know that was a popular view. Uh, it was one that I had because of what it looked like last year and his usage of White and Lewis. Uh, and, uh, and once those players kind of went down, that's when Blount, or Blount really surged on. And so it was a, a very, very popular view, one that I had. And I am uh, pleasantly uh, shocked and actually surprised and, and actually kind of glad. Yeah, it's, you know, as a Husky fan, it makes it tough to see an Oregon, uh, yeah. <laughs> to see an Oregon Duck doing well. But um, anyways, so yeah, um, I, you know, ride that, ride the, ride the blunt train. He is, he's absolutely, you know, he is, he is producing every week. Um, Procise, I think, you know, may go down a little bit. And part of the reason I'm going over these great performances is, you know, what should we expect down the road? Um, you know, blunt, you know, keep riding him. As until I think unless he gets injured, this is going to be the way they're going to go. Um, I think Wilson really gets it going. I think this is the beginning of him really taking off again. Um, another another person we wanted to look at was Marcus Mariota. He talked about just absolutely brutalizing the Green Bay defense. I mean, I could not believe it when I looked down at my phone and it was like. 21 to nothing only a few minutes into the first quarter. I mean, it was just, I mean, I couldn't believe it. And then, you know, to see the final score, 47 to 25, Marcus Mariota throws for just under 300 yards and four touchdowns. I mean, he, he was absolutely amazing. I mean, he's, he's gone kind of back and forth the last few weeks in terms of putting up a good performance and a bad performance efficiency wise but in terms of um if you just go by his fantasy points let me pull that up real quick uh, like i said we're so professional that we look up stuff as we're going uh, well he's had the last, uh, since week five he has yeah. scored at least 20 points um and outside of those Outside of two weeks against Indianapolis and Jacksonville, he has scored at minimum thirty-four points. Yeah, so I mean, he's what? Well, well, and even the Jacksonville and, and, and Indianapolis games, twenty and twenty-three points, and that's in four point. I want to say it's four points per 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 passing touchdown, and so he's thrown for twenty-one TDs so far this year, which I mean, and they've still got what one two. They have the late buy. They have the week thirteen buy. So the last week of regular season for a lot of for a lot of teams to do a three week playoff. Um, Playoffs are not nice to him, by the way. Denver, Kansas City, Jacksonville, and Houston. No. <laughs> so you know that can be that that could be a little bit brutal for him. But in terms of getting to the playoffs, that's a, that's a good setup. So if you have, I know that there are some leagues that that have open trading throughout the entire season. If you have Mariota, this could be a potential time for him to be traded uh, because Indianapolis was one of those games, was his lowest scoring game uh, out, uh, since week five. Um, he only threw two touchdowns, um, and so he's going to be at Indianapolis this week. Um, and so that could be an option if, uh, if your league still has uh, trades available. 
Yeah. And then I, I think you would be, it would be irresponsible of us to not talk about Ezekiel Elliott and what, uh, yeah. and what he did in this game. I mean, this, this, he, I mean, the Dallas backfield of Ezekiel Elliott and Dak Prescott is proving to be a combo, the MVPs of the season. Uh, kind of a flash, well, not too far flashback, but kind of like a Russell Wilson, Marshawn Lynch, wouldn't you say? A little bit, but the fact that they're both rookies is, yeah. is, is what we're looking at here. I mean, if you look at Ezekiel Elliott, he, he had three T, three TDs in this last game, so it gives him nine rushing. He has 1,000 yards already in just nine games. 1,000 rushing yards yep. in just nine games. I mean, how ridiculous is that? I kind of want to make a bold prediction at this point because looking at his schedule the rest of the way, outside of Baltimore this next week, he has easy – well, I, I shouldn't say easy – defenses, but he's got Washington, Minnesota, who's currently massively struggling against uh, the run defense, Tampa Bay, who's decimated, and Detroit, which is quite possibly the worst defense in the league. But he's going up against easier defenses the rest of the way out. Yeah, championship week, he's got Detroit. Yeah, he only needs 1,800 yards, uh, I believe, total or, or close there, to eclipse the uh, rookie season rushing record and my bold prediction, maybe not, maybe it's not that crazy or bold, is that he will actually do that this year. Yeah, I I, I agree. I mean, he is, you know, like we said, he was he was set up to succeed. I congratulate all those who had the the huevos to yes. to actually draft him in the first round. Um, again, me being a PPR guy, I. I just I don't I don't go after running backs in the first round. You know I I I haven't for the what three or four years now. For those of you that do and were willing to take the risk, congratulations. Um, uh, for those of you who managed to be able to uh, snooker someone into trading away Ezekiel Elliott, even more congratulations. The MVP of your league. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, I, I, I do want to say one thing before we get too far off Ezekiel Elliott is I, I want to give him all the props this season, but I think this was a, a benefit also of Tony Romo being injured and there being a rookie quarterback, knowing what they have in Ezekiel Elliott being a first round draft pick and being a workhorse type running back and proving it at Ohio State that they leaned on him a little bit more. And that has been uh, a very, very successful uh, way of going about it for the Dallas offense. And I think that has a little bit to do with the bigger numbers. I'm not saying he wouldn't have had a great season, but I think them relying on the running game a little bit more has opened up everything else for Dak Prescott. Well, yeah, really. And that's, and that's, that's what I was going to, that's what I was going to also. I mean, if you look at his, you know, Prescott's uh, season so far, He's only thrown for 14 TDs, but he's only thrown the two interceptions so far on the season. Um, you know, and he's he's been very efficient. His point totals, I mean, he's 86% owned now. That you wouldn't have even seen that, you know, coming into the bye when he was having in week seven when he was having, you know, four good weeks in a row, five, really five good weeks in a row. And then the last few against Philadelphia, Cleveland, and even he didn't, he wasn't terrible against Pittsburgh. He threw for 300 yards and two TDs, which is better than a streaming option, which, yep. you know, you're looking for 250 and two TDs in a streamer. So, you know, yeah. And, you know, even for him, he has some, um, a couple of decent defenses to be able to throw against. So, uh, you know, again, congratulations so far to the Dallas Cowboys. And what they've been able to do with, again, with, with Dak Prescott and, and Ezekiel Elliott. Like we said, we, we, we don't normally spend a whole lot of time going over some of the big performances from the previous, you know, from, from the previous week. I want to make sure that there, was, there were some, some outstanding performances that I thought should be recognized. And, and so uh, just kind of to review that, now let's, you know, why don't we go ahead and head into the waiver wire and figure out uh, 
who everyone should pick up. Now that we're this late in the season, I mean, at this point, there's not a lot of options to pick up. Yeah, if, if you are high on the waiver wire order, your team is, nearly, is either out or nearly out of the playoffs, or you're on a rotational waiver system or you're on a fab system. And so this is where you're going to have to spend a little bit more fab if you've got it. Uh, if you're on a rotational system, good luck. You got the luck of the draw late in the season. If you either that, or you, either that or you were just smart with when you actually went after people. Exactly. Or you are out of the playoffs. Now, for those of you who are out of the playoffs, uh, the, here's some fantasy football advice that I like to use because I'm this type of player. Don't lay down because this is an annoying thing uh, for those who, who play regularly. Um, you don't want to just give up and kind of gift the rest of the season to some of the players because, one, it's a little unfair to those who have played honestly throughout the entire season. But also, you can kind of play that, that stick-it role to where you may be able to – maybe that guy who, who never traded you that trade or whatever is just behind you in the waiver order, and he, you can pick up the player that might have helped him get to the playoffs, and maybe there's that little spike factor. But that's just my type of playing. Uh, when I don't make the playoffs, I get really, really annoyed and irritated uh, and, and kind of turn to the spite game uh, a little bit. That's just my type of a player. All, once of always in, do fun. I don't get a little crazy. But uh, once again, if you're going to play fantasy football, please play all the way to the end of the season. Uh, it's only fair to everyone who's playing. I absolutely agree. I love I – if I mean, I've only had a couple times where I've – um, you know, been so far out of it that I know I wasn't going to make the playoffs. For the most part, I'm usually I'm usually pretty close. If we're getting in the last few weeks. Usually, it's I have to win. You know, if my team is you know kind of on the the lower end of of you know of the the playoff schedule or the playoff uh, possibilities, it's usually where I'm having to win like one or two games, like the last two. I'm always I'm usually in it to the last couple weeks. If I'm going to miss, I love playing spoiler. I love exactly. beating you got nothing else to end. play for. You're not playing for the playoffs. Play to knock somebody out. Correct. Or play to play to you know play to knock someone down, you know, down, you know, uh, a position or two so that they have a tougher matchup um in in the playoffs. You know, have you know You're not gonna mess with the top seeds. No. You have fun messing with those middle seeds. Or you know, maybe you may you know, if you've got, you know, if you get lucky, you maybe you knock one of those, you know, one of those top seeds down so that they don't have a first round buy in the playoffs. If it's you have a three week playoff system, and maybe they have a Tennessee player who they're starting in week thirteen in the playoffs, and <laughs> really screw them, and they were banking on that first week buy. You just never know. Yeah. It's just one of those things. This is one of the things that you, if you're not going to make playoffs, this is something to play for. Play for the spike factor. Play for spoiler factor. It's something that. That's always fun to do, especially when it's successful, uh, because that's really all you've got left to play for, yeah. other than just the enjoyment of playing fantasy football and the enjoyment of watching the NFL. Well, I, I do have one league that actually has a side pot, so we, you know, you've got the the money for, you know, everyone puts money in the pot for you know whoever finishes first, second, and third. We also do a side pot in one of my leagues for the highest uh, total single week uh, single week point total. And Is so that every week or total for the whole season. Total, total for the whole season. So whoever has the whoever has the best overall single week on the season, and luckily for me, I've you know I'm got one league that I just keep dropping. I think uh, six teams are in the playoffs, and I think this week's loss will move me down to sixth place. So I'm kind of on the edge with a few with like three weeks left to go. I am the third highest scorer in that league, but I have had more points scored against me than the top team in the league has scored. <laughs> yeah, tell me. Yeah, that's so. You play in my league, <laughs> so I am now now four, four and six in that league um, after ten weeks. And so in that league, I'm actually because of the phenomenal week I had in week two or three, the week three. When Marvin Jones had that huge game against Green Bay, I had Matthew Stafford. Evans went off for, you know, went off for two TDs, and AJ Green had a massive game. Um, 
yeah, thanks to that, I'm I'm in the lead. I don't think anyone's come within 40 points of my point total from that week. So, uh, so yeah, you know, if you've got a maybe a league that does that, that's also something that you can be playing for. So, all right, let's get to the waiver wire. Yeah, uh, let's get to the waiver wire. Uh, we've got a quarterback that uh, I think we only have one. Uh, we I cheated a little bit when it came to the quarterback scenario, but this is for those of you who have – there's not a lot of competition for quarterbacks this late in the season because you either have one or you don't. Uh, in addition, you're really probably only covering the quarterback if you have uh, someone like a Matt Ryan out of Atlanta, Trevor Simeon uh, out of Denver, or Phillip Rivers. Uh, you're covering your bye week. And so this week, uh, for me, he's at 61%, so he's just a little bit out of the reach. But I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that there's a lot of people who just don't pay attention anymore this late into the season, which is a shame. And so that's why his numbers bumped a little bit. So that's what I'm crediting the bump on his percentages because he's just had a bye week. Most people don't carry more than one quarterback unless you're in uh, a very, very deep league and you don't want to lose the, the spot on the waiver wire. But for me, Tyrod Taylor had an incredible game against Seattle before the bye. He's been on by this last week. In the last six games, he has seven passing touchdowns and one interception and three rushing touchdowns. He goes against Cincinnati this week, but I believe that the, uh, the Bills' offense has changed dramatically since the change of the offensive coordinator. They are playing better offense, um, and Tyrod Taylor is not my only waiver wire pickup from the Buffalo Bills this next week. And so I believe that the Buffalo Bills are a much improved offense once again with LaShawn McCoy taking the lead out of the backfield, but Gillisley still getting some points. But I think Tyrod Taylor is a great player because he adds that running value to though he may not get as many touchdowns as some of the other quarterbacks, he's making it up with his legs to get some extra points. Uh, I agree with you there. I mean, really, he's the only – I mean, I've looked at – I've looked at some of the other quarterbacks that, that are available at this point, um, and there's just – there's nothing that really – Nothing looks very nice. No, it, it all looks extremely ugly. And so um, – let me – sorry, reload that page. So, yeah, I, you know, Tyrod Taylor coming off a of bye, I think he is, he is the best bet. Again, no one, no one looks all that great um, in, terms of, in terms of the matchup. Um, yeah, everyone's, everyone's got a rough matchup. Let me go to the last couple. Yeah. Cause you've, you've got some bye weeks as well. You know, even I'm not even taking Brock, Osweiler, Brock Osweiler against Oakland. You know, he's the, I think the regular starters. Nope. Case Keenum and Cody Kessler are projected for less than him. So and neither one of those I would. Yeah. I don't, stream. I don't, I don't want, I don't want any of them to be completely honest. So. So yeah, uh, Tyra Taylor is really the only guy that I'd want on, on, uh, on off of waivers this week. Uh, moving into the running back position, I have two. Uh, first one is Rob Kelly is owned in 48% of leagues, and so he's right there on the bubble. Uh, he's going to be playing Green Bay this week, whose defense is not that great. Um, Rob Kelly has rushed for 85 yards plus the last two weeks, and so – whether you are in a PPR or a standard, you're going to get some, some solid yards from Rob Kelly. And so I believe he is a valuable pick, especially if you have uh, waiver wire priority. If, if you are hurting at running back like tons of rosters are and Rob Kelly is available, you, I think this should be, to me, this is higher uh, than any other player outside of Tyrod Taylor because obviously you need a quarterback. But to me, Rob Kelly should be your highest waiver wire priority in my book of the ones that I'm going to mention. Yeah, I think the, the one thing that makes it a little bit tough for Rob Kelly, I mean, Green Bay's defense isn't great, but their run defense is still uh, in the top four in terms of yards per game. They're only giving up, uh, they're only giving up 85 yards per game on the ground. Now, part of that's because they're, they're – the passing the defense defense backfield is, yeah, is – here, let's go to pass yards per game. Green Bay is – well, actually, they're in the middle of the pack at 253 yards per game. But uh, they're, they're very, very beatable through the air. So um, it helps that Matt Jones was a healthy scratch this last week. 
Yeah. So obviously, they have. You know, he has lost. Matt Jones has lost favor um, in in Washington. So uh, Rob Kelly, yeah, he's the starting guy. So especially in a in a standard league, um, I agree that Kelly's the way to go. Uh, uh, yeah, go oh, ahead and give your other running back. Uh, my other one. This is this is one. This one is more for those of you who have either all but locked up the playoffs or have locked up the playoffs because Thomas Rawls right now is only 49% of leagues. If you feel lucky, there's go ahead and get him. There's no indication that he's a starter. There's no indication that he will even play this week. He is practicing to play. Anything can happen in the next week before the game. But Thomas Rawls, once again, you want to bank on that flash that he had at the end of the season. But once again, he hasn't done anything this year. He's done nothing. And once again, my pick for running back bust of the season, I think that comes to a close because he's going to finally be on the field. Once again, picked him as a bust only because of the injury uh, problems that he may face, which he ended up facing. But once again, Thomas Rawls, if you feel lucky, because I don't think C.J. Procise, I don't think they're going to go with the rookie. I think they'll go more with a more trusted, valuable commodity in Thomas Rawls because Thomas Rawls can really be that smashing running back that Seattle uh, does very, very well with, kind of like that Marshawn Lynch role. So I think Thomas Rawls being a more complete back would be the starter if he's 100%, but there's no indication that he's going to be that this week. So only for deeper teams uh, or, or teams that are going to make the playoff run. Yeah, I agree with you there. Uh, Thomas Rawls has, is more, is, again, like we said, is more that smash mouth guy. Um, I'm actually, you know, staying, staying on that team. Uh, one of my guys, CJ Procise at 35%. Again, Procise is going to be more of a PPR guy type of waiver wire pickup uh, because of his ability to catch the ball out of the backfield. He is not built to be an every down back. Now he is, I mean, he's not small. I think I want to say he's like 6'1", 215 is about what they, they put his, uh, his uh, stats at. So um, he's, he runs a little upright, but he has, he does have the ability to kind of put, uh, uh, put a lick on guys, you know, drop the shoulder. I just don't think that for right now he is he is that type of guy. So they're going to be a little more careful. He also is not really in game shape because of you know he's been dealing with injuries you know throughout the season. But at only thirty five percent owned, especially in PPR leagues, if you need a guy who's going to be able to put up some points for you, CJ Procise I think is definitely a way to go. Um, he's going to be used, especially with uh, with Russell Wilson being more healthy. With the uh, and being able to throw the ball, the other guy, uh, James Starks, twenty eight percent owned. He's going up against Washington. Um, we saw in this in this last week um, in Green Bay that Ty Montgomery lost a lot of work to James Starks. Um, let me. This James Starks is a running back. Yeah, again, because he is an actual running back. Uh, let me pull it up here. James Starks played 71% of the snaps in Week 10 against the Titans. Ty Montgomery was limited to 22 plays. Now, we don't know for sure if Ty Montgomery's limited play had to do still with, his, with the sickle cell trait and his illness that he's dealing with. But I think part of it also has to do with James Starks is a running back and has, been, and has always been used as a running back. And the Titans defense is, you know, Titans defense is, is a little bit different uh, and different of an animal. But going up against Washington, they're going, they're going at Washington. They'll be the Sunday night game. Um, I think that um, James Starks should have a pretty good game against Washington. Let me look up their, their defensive statistics, rush yards per game. Washington is near the bottom. Yeah, they've moved up a little bit. Uh, 23rd, they've given up 115 yards per game on the ground. And so, um, you know, I think Starks could be, if as long as they keep using him like this and actually use the running game, I think that Starks could be in for a decent game. And, you know, at this point, if you're not yet officially in the playoffs, you need all the running back help you can get. And James Starks uh, is a guy that I'd be, I'd be fishing for, so. 
Okay, moving into the wide receiver role. Uh, my number one wide receiver to pick up right now is only 33% of leagues. And for those of you who dropped in this last week, you're all going, don't, because Alshon Jeffrey is now out for four weeks. Cameron Meredith is going to be uh, bumped back to that uh, influential role, the wide receiver role, uh, with Alshon Jeffrey out for the, fir- for the next four weeks. The next four weeks are the Giants, Tennessee, San Francisco, and Detroit. So against San Francisco and Detroit, look for Cam Meredith to have good games because those are atrocious defenses. Uh, Detroit especially against the, the passing game. And so Cameron Meredith, though he may not have the greatest chemistry uh, with Jay Cutler, he did get a 50-yard touchdown bomb this last week. And if the Bears give up on the season, and say they start Hoyer, not saying that that's going to happen, once again, you're going to see Cameron Meredith's numbers skyrocket because Hoyer's going to be trying to get back to a starting role, possibly with another team, or maybe try to earn the starting role with the Bears next season. So There's not a lot of confidence in Jay Cutler uh, within the coaching staff. And so I believe Jay Meredith is is a great player. Jay Cutler has completely lost the locker room. So and that was actually one of the one of the news notes that I actually miss. Uh, they're still going to start him for now, but Jay Cutler has completely lost the locker room. People, I mean, there have been reports of players that are absolutely disgusted with his um, lack of preparation. So, I think that comes down to he came back to a team that was one in what one in six, one in seven. Not saying that's any sort of excuse, but it's one of those things that like he may have been excited at the beginning of the year. And now there's literally no chance for the playoffs. But once again, these are professionals. They should be playing hard. They're playing for their contracts. They're playing to support their families. A lot of these guys need these checks and aren't the big money guys and are taking a beating uh, and and want to be on a successful team. Yeah. All All right. right. Is that was sorry? Okay. Uh, My other wide receiver is once again the other Buffalo Bill that I wanted to mention is Robert Woods. Once again, since the offensive coordinator change, Robert Woods' role is increasing every week. They're coming off of a bye week after a great performance against a very good Seattle defense. Once again, they're playing Cincinnati. Uh, Robert Woods had like 160 yards against Seattle's defense. They do not give up very many 100-yard receivers. And so Robert Woods is being a pivotal part of the offense from the wide receiver perspective, and I, believe, and I believe that that will continue. Once again, he's only owning 16% of leagues, so unless you're in a very, very deep league, he's probably widely available. And so once again, with the Bills increasing and, and doing very, very well moving forward, I believe Robert Woods is a viable option to pick up. Yeah, I'd agree with you there. Um, my, my one guy that I'm looking at, um, is Sammy Coates? Um, you know he's only had he's only had one one catch over the last month. However, he's only had Ben Roethlisberger for a couple games. The Baltimore game, Roethlisberger wasn't even completely healthy. He was just coming back after after having that meniscus uh, um, cleanup surgery on his knee. This last week they were playing against Dallas, who Dallas has a pretty good defense. Um, that's I believe is very very underrated. Um, he had this week. Sammy has the Cleveland defense. Cleveland is the worst. Is I want to say the worst or second worst overall defense in the league. Um, they are giving up 275 yards through the air per game. Notable. They're also giving up 143 rush yards per game. So all you Le'Veon Bell owners should be happy about your uh, your your matchups next year. Yes, um, and and it's also notable that uh, Cleveland gives up thirty points a game. The only team that gives up more is San Francisco at thirty one and a half points a game. So I think that now that Ben Roethlisberger is getting a little bit healthier, uh, is getting you know getting more and more. I think that Sammy Coates could be in for a decent game this next week against um, against a, a terrible Cleveland uh, defense. So. He's also going up against Indianapolis the following week. 
Uh, the only thing that I would caution some players on is the Ben Roethlisberger numbers between home and away games and the spread that is there. He does very, very well at home and is average on away games. And that would be the only hesitation that I would have is that Roethlisberger is known to be average in away games and Sammy Coates being the number two option and then looking to probably be ahead in this game and then default, defaulting to Le'Veon Bell. That would be the only concern I would have. But once again, if you're a team that needs a splash, Sammy Coates is that splash. He's going to get the deep yards and they're going to throw the ball to him deep four or five times a game. Yeah, and, and really that's, that's you know, again, I don't like a lot of the options. You know, for me, I draft wide receiver heavy, so in most of my leagues, I'm not worried about my wide receivers. I'm more worried about the running backs. But in terms of looking at who's available and who has the best matchups that could be a dart throw to, you know, to help move you forward, Sammy Coates is the best option I see. Okay, and moving on to the tight end, I believe we only have one unless you have a tight end, Ryan. I have a tight end. You do have a tight end. Okay, uh, so the same one as you, but okay, the only one that I have that I believe is is worth anything at this point, just because of the massive inconsistencies. Once again, to me, tight ends are like throwing darts. There has not really been a lot of consistency from the tight end position, unless you own one of the top six, unless you own uh, someone like a a Travis Kelsey. Uh, or or a Gronkowski or a Bennett, you're not going to get very consistent numbers um, because I believe the game is moving slightly away from the tight ends. But that's neither here nor there. I believe the Darius Green can be someone to pick up because they're beginning to work him back in. And he has shown very, very big splashes in San Diego. Once again, with Ben Roethlisberger liking his bigger targets around the end zone, the that was kind of the, the draw for Jesse James was he was the big target around the end zone. That now is Ladarius Green. And Ladarius Green has much better hands and much better route running capabilities for down the field. So I believe Ladarius Green would be someone that you'd want to pick up if you're desperate, if you have uh, tight ends that are missing off of buys this week. So you've got a Hunter Henry and Antonio Gates and you need a start. Ladarius Green would be someone who's only owned in 10% of leagues who could be a viable option. Once again, there's not really a whole lot out there in terms of the tight end position because there's just not the depth at tight end. Yeah, the only other – I mean, I think that's that's a possibility. You know, we'll see how he integrates into that offense. Um, you know, I'm just – I'm not totally sold yet just because we haven't seen anything from him. So he is one that I'd be hesitant on. Uh, the the guy that I have is the guy that we keep we keep naming every single week. The hat, CJ Fedorowicz. Um, you know he this last game wasn't you know wasn't exactly great, and I actually have a little bit of a stat correction uh, that I gave last week. I was talking about uh, CJ Fedor the the difference between CJ Fedorowicz and and DeAndre Hopkins. Um, over the pre what was it the previous five games from uh, week four through week eight, um, I had said that uh, C.J. Fedorowicz uh, over a five-game span had 34 targets, 24 receptions, 272 yards, and three TDs. Uh, Hopkins over that same amount of time, I want to say, was 42 catches, 202 yards, and one TD. I said he had no TDs; he did have the one. So, uh, but still, over the past. Six games total. Um, let me make sure I've got that. And Fedorowicz. Um, the two of them, let's see, how did Fedorowicz do this week? Yeah, over the last, uh, over the last five, six games, C.J. Fedorowicz has outperformed DeAndre Hopkins. More yards. Ouch. More yards, less catches, but more yards and two more TDs. So, I mean, ugh. yeah. So, I think a lot of that is just Osweiler's not a very good quarterback, can't get the ball downfield. And so, um, he's better off, you know, throwing those short passes to the, to the tight end. Um, and so, I like Fedorowicz. He's going up against a, a shaky defense in Oakland. 
Um, they've got the Monday night game this week in Mexico City. And so I like uh, I like Fedorowicz again, 21% owned. Um, I think he's a, you know, again, like you said, at this point, unless you have one of the top guys, you're just looking for passable numbers. And I think Fedorowicz is still going to get targets. I mean, he he hasn't had less than five targets since week three against New England. So, uh, you know, five, eight, seven, 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 and five. So I think that he he has he still has some good matchups coming up. So Fedorowicz is definitely a guy that I'm that I'm looking at. So. Uh, does that kind of wrap us up? I do have one thing if, if you have nothing uh, left, Ryan. Uh, defenses in terms of streaming defenses, real quick. Uh, Dallas is only 40% owned. They're going up against Baltimore. Like I said, Dallas is playing at home. I believe that Dallas is a very underrated defense, so if I, I don't think it's a, a bad idea to go ahead and pick them up. And then maybe kind of a shot, in, well, not necessarily a shot in the dark, but uh, a defense that is playing better, that has a really terrible um, terrible offense that they're going up against. Uh, the Miami Dolphins are only 19% owned, and they're going up against the Rams. The Rams scored nine points against the New York Jets. Ouch. Yeah. And so Miami had four interceptions of Phillip Rivers in the fourth quarter alone in this last game. So I like uh, I like the Miami defense as a, as a streamer pick at only 19% owned against the Rams. So that's that's uh, now all I all I have. So. Uh, I only want to cover this because I'm asking for a friend, but I want everyone to hear this because I, I can't be the only one who's thinking about this. Marvin Jones Jr., what do you do with him? You've only got a few weeks left before the playoffs. Is he a mandatory keeper? Is he a droppable player? Uh, I'll, I'll preface it with this. If someone has Marvin Jones on their team and they are on the bubble of playoffs, would you drop him for any of the waiver wire players that you selected for the show today? I would not drop him for Sammy Coates. Okay. Because he is still in a, in a pass first. Marvin Jones is still in a pass first offense in which their top running back is a receiver in theoretic. The, he is, he is still, you could probably consider the number three, no less than the number three passing option. Um, Sammy Coates will never be more than the number three passing option. Yep. Um, and so I, I would definitely keep Marvin Jones over Sammy Coates. We've seen Marvin Jones be, for the most part, somewhat, um, somewhat reliable early. And really what it is is once they decided to get Golden Tate involved, that's what took, um, that's what took some, some, some time away from Marvin Jones. Um, I mean, they, they were just absolutely pouring the targets on Marvin Jones early. You know, 10, 11, 8, and 7 in the first four weeks. Since then, 5, 6, 5, 7, and 5. And so they, I don't, from what I've seen, they haven't been giving Marvin Jones um, – high percentage targets. A lot of it has been those deep balls, which guys hit, which the defensive have, the defenses have been um, scheming against. And so in terms of that, I, I keep Marvin Jones over Sammy Coates. I keep Marvin Jones over Robert Woods. Again, because in Buffalo, it is a run first offense. Yes. LaShawn McCoy, then Tyrod Taylor. Then Mike Gillisley, and then a receiver. Correct. Um, I mean, I still think uh, Robert Woods is still because because um, oh because Sammy Watkins is still out on IR. You know, Woods is their best is their best receiving option. But I still don't. I still wouldn't trust him week to week. Marvin Jones, I am still willing to play with some of the rest of the schedule. I mean, he's got Jackson. They're they got Jacksonville coming off their first week off the bye. They still have um, a game against New Orleans, um, who you know gives up a ton of pass yards. They still have a game against Chicago, who gives up a ton of pass yards. Um, and who else? Minnesota has not been playing great defense, and that'll be yeah. the Thanksgiving game. And so that could go either way because that'll be a short week. Um, it's a four-day gap. Yeah, yeah. Playing Sunday and then Thursday. 
Um, yeah, well, you know, at least they they're coming off the bye and then doing you know yeah. and then doing two games in five in two games in five days. So, um, I still like some of the matchups there. So I'm I'm personally willing to stick with Marvin Jones, hoping that after the bye they figure out ways to get him more involved. Yeah, we were all talking about with the absence of Megatron. Uh, is that there would be kind of this 1A and 1B role within Marvin Jones and Golden Tate. It's kind of been the 1A in the first four games, Marvin Jones. Now the B in that the last couple, the last four games has really been the Golden Tate show. Uh, once again, they did play some tougher defenses. I mean, LA has kind of been some historical, I mean, some, some solid def- defensive teams, Minnesota, Houston has played well uh, defensively. Um, But the next couple of games are against lighter opponents defensively because Minnesota is not the team they were a couple of weeks ago. I mean, look over the next four weeks. It's over the next four weeks. It's Jacksonville, Minnesota, New Orleans, Chicago. Uh, To me, it's just a crying shame that week 17, which is probably part of nobody's fantasy football league. It should against Green Bay football league. Uh, against Green Bay, where he had that monstrous game, will not count for most people in fantasy football unless you've got him and you're in a championship game in the last week of the season. Yep. So, but I mean, so, he's, he's still on pace for a thousand yards and six TDs on the season, six or seven TDs, which is a you know it's a wide receiver three. Yep. Which is what a lot of people were kind of you know were for the most part you were expecting. What's what he's been most of his career is about a wide receiver three. Yeah. So. He has the potential of going more, but I'm not. I'm not dropping him for any of the any of the waiver wire options yeah. this week. And so that is our show. Once again, we want to thank you guys for stopping by the Skull King Fantasy Football Podcast. Once again, get out, uh, send us those likes, those shares, give us some comments back on the YouTube and on the iTunes uh, podcast as well get out get those waivers in good luck the last couple of weeks of the season hopefully you guys are still in the playoff hunt once again i have been justin skullrude and i am ryan skullrude and this has been the skull king fantasy football podcast enjoy the rest of your week guys all right we'll talk to you later